Welcome to everybody for our Good Friday communion service. I want you all to know something. I've prayed over every single one of you that has joined this communion live stream. And I can't emphasize this enough. We're walking on majestic territory when we dedicate ourselves at the very hour that Jesus was nailed to the cross. We commemorate more than 2,000 years ago the fact that Jesus was nailed to the cross at noon and breathed his last at three. And I'm so grateful that you have chosen to carve out this block of time in your day to honor the most majestic and glorious thing that has ever happened in history to date. And because you honor this day, you will be a part of honoring the next greatest day to come when we see his face. Amen. So thank you for being with us. This is a solemn remembrance and prayerfully the Holy Spirit has put it on my heart before we take communion. So be sure that you have juice and or bread or cracker with you there. But before we take communion, I want to trace for you the depth of communion quickly. We're not going to belabor any of these points, but I want to trace it as far back as it goes. Because I want to get to the root of the issue, which has been a question that so many have asked since Jesus said it. He said to his followers, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in me. And that's a hard statement. It's very direct. And what did Jesus mean by it? We don't want to take that for granted. We want to take communion in a worthy way and understand what he meant. So I'm going to ask you, along with myself, we're going to humble our hearts to the Lord and ask him to open this up to us before we take communion together. Lord Jesus, what a day that was 2,000 years ago. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made. And as we gather together to honor communion as you have asked us to do my prayer is that your holy spirit would work through your word and that you would open up the depth and the meaning of everything that we so often take for granted and don't leave even one person who hears this message unsaved without your blood washing away their sins and I thank you, Lord. Amen. We're going to trace the meaning of communion from manna to the bread of life to Passover to the Last Supper to communion to heaven. Here we go. Manna. Go back to the Old Testament and we read these scriptures. How many of you know that God's people, the Israelites, when they came out of Egypt, God took them through the wilderness? Do you remember that? When he took them through the wilderness, they began to grumble. They were hungry. They missed all the great food that they had in Egypt, and they began to grumble. But here's what God did. God said, the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people will go out and gather a day's portion every single day that I may test them whether they will walk in the law or not. And on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. Notice what God said way back in the Old Testament, before anybody ever really understood the shadows of the reality of the coming Messiah and his sacrifice, God said, I'm going to rain down bread from heaven. And so the first thing that I want you to know is that Jesus is supernatural supply from heaven. And on any ordinary day, when you're grappling with your own sin and your own guilt, as I yesterday was at the funeral of a loved one, when we grapple with the, with the deep issues of life, we know in those moments that we need something that's greater than what's from the earth. Hallelujah. Jesus is supernatural supply from heaven, just like that manna 
those, uh, they tasted like honey. These wafers literally came down from the clouds for God's people to meet their physical need for bread. And then the Bible goes on to say, this is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each of you, as much as he can eat. You'll take one omer, and an omer was about two quarts, two quarts of this bread, according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. How many of you know that that's, that might be what we do as people? God says gather about two quarts of this stuff, and some gather more, some gather less. Not everybody's precise. But what is so incredible about this is when they measured it with an omer, after they got home and they measured what they had, whoever had gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he or she could eat. Listen, I know there are some of you who are participating in this and you feel an insecurity as far as your relationship with Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you something. Just go after him. Just collect what you can of Jesus Christ. Take in what you're able intellectually to understand. Believe by faith what you are able to believe by faith. And I promise you something. Those people who think they're better than other people and they've gotten more of Christ than others don't really have more of him. And those who think they don't have enough of him, he will be enough for them. Amen? What a beautiful, beautiful promise. Jesus is always exactly what we need. We may not do it perfectly, but our hearts come to him and he is exactly what we need. Then Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over till morning. But they did not listen to Moses and some left part of it till morning and it bred worms and stank. Listen to this. If they over collected and tried to keep it for the next day, if they tried to take the day's supply and keep it into the next day, God let it teem with worms. And how many of you know you're not going to eat the manna that's teeming with worms? What is God saying? That when it comes to Jesus Christ, we must trust him daily and perpetually. Who is thankful that no matter what a day holds, when the sun rises the next day, you're able to trust Jesus all over again? I don't need to go into the future. I don't need to worry about what the future holds. All I need to do is hold on to Jesus. He supplies He wants me to trust him one day at a time. I can't stockpile my faith. When I wake up the next day, he'll give me faith for the next day. And then the last incredible thing to see about this is on the sixth day, right? Right before the Sabbath, on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord had commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest. It's a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil and all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the next morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them and it did not stink and there were no worms in it. See, every regular day of the week, they could only take as much as they needed and not try to stockpile it. But on the sixth day, God said, I do want you to collect two days worth. Because on the Sabbath, I want you to rest. And I want you to see that I will be your supply on the day of rest. Now, there's a lot of spiritual truth in that. The fact that we all need to honor the Sabbath, the day of rest in our life. But I want to go deeper with that. And I want to tell you about Jesus. Jesus, what we have of him will be enough for our ultimate rest. If you read the book of Hebrews, you'll find in Hebrews chapter 4, That God tells us Jesus actually is our rest. He's not just a day of rest. He's not just a time of rest. But when I come to Jesus, I can rest my heart and my life and my hope and everything in him. And so when I see him face to face, who is thankful to know that heaven is a place of rest? Never again will we be restless or weary or tired. What a beautiful picture that the bread of life, which is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, will always be enough 
until we reach heaven. Hallelujah. What a beautiful truth. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations. So take one omer of this manna and keep it forever so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. What is happening here is in the Ark of the Covenant, God told the Israelites to keep the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, to keep Aaron's rod that budded, but he also said, keep a wafer of that manna, keep an omer of it, I guess a jar of it, there in front of the Ten Commandments, in front of the testimony in the ark. Keep it there perpetually so that the people will remember. And the same of Jesus. We have to continually set communion before us to keep in mind the Savior by which we are fed. Did you ever wonder why Jesus said to keep partaking of communion? Because we as human beings need a constant physical reminder of who Jesus is. And so that's what we're doing today on Good Friday. We're setting that communion in front of us to remember what he has done, just as God faithfully provided for his people. That's the manna. That happened in the book of Exodus after they left Egypt. But we're going to jump to the New Testament now, and we're going to go to where Jesus uses the manna, the reality, the historical reality of physical bread coming from the clouds for the people of God, God, Jesus uses this to explain the depth of who he is. John chapter 6, Jesus just fed the 5,000. He did an incredible miracle. They were all hungry. He fed their stomachs. Many people were super pleased with that. You know, they'd had a good meal. And so the Bible tells us that they, they even crossed over the sea to keep following Jesus. But many of them were following him for the wrong reason. And when they found Jesus, he said as much to them. He said, look, you're only following me because I gave you physical bread. You're not following me for the right reasons. You're just following me for the miracle. And then Jesus said to the people, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which a son of man will give to you. How many people today are working for stuff of this life that just perishes and is gone? And again, I was at the funeral of a loved one yesterday. And I'll tell you what, when you look at a hearse and when you watch a casket being put into a hearse, the stark reality and the shock of death just hits you and reminds you that you need to be partaking of eternal food. Because one day, everything here is left behind. But my friends, there is a food that is not only real here, it continues to endure right into eternity. And Jesus said, the son of man will give it to you. My friends, Jesus offers food that endures to eternal life. Who's grateful? Who's tired and weary of this life? Who's wondering how soon he's going to return? Who's thinking about death at times and wanting to be reminded that the food he feeds you now will carry you into eternity. Jesus went on to say, now look, here it is. We were talking about the manna. Jesus said, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, okay, so they're arguing with Jesus, kind of saying, well, what, what kind of sign are you going to show us or what miracle are you going to do? Well, he just fed the 5,000, but they're always looking for a sign. And they said, well, our fathers were better off because they got bread from heaven. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus was saying the manna was just a picture. The real bread that God gives is a he. It is Jesus Christ. Jesus said to them, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven. And they said to him, well, sir, if that's true, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will never hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Who is grateful? No matter what you have or don't have ever in life, if you have Jesus, you have everything. And that spiritual craving inside of you and that longing for love, you want to know that somebody loves you unconditionally, that somebody forgives you, that somebody is holding you. Here he is. He is the bread of life. That when you come to him, you never hunger. When you believe in him, you never thirst. You know, Jesus told them, he said, sure, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, but there came a day when they died. It was physical. It wasn't spiritual. Matthew Henry said, Christ is that bread to the soul, which bread is to the body. He nourishes and supports the spiritual life as bread does the bodily life. Do you know that when you're hungry, you go to get food? Let's call it bread as a general representation of food. When you are physically hungry and you know your body is weak, what do you do? You go to get bread to eat. I want to tell you something. We are spiritually weak. We are spiritually weak and empty until we go to Jesus, the bread of life, and take him in. Jesus, God gives something infinitely better than manna. Goes on to say, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is an incredible, incredible statement. When we talk about the return of Jesus Christ and the rising out of the graves, the coming out of the urns, the coming out of wherever the molecules of your body are scattered. When we talk about the reality of the physical resurrection of the dead, when the spirit that has been safe with Christ is now met up with a brand new, undying, sinless body. Wow, that's what Jesus is talking about here. He said, I won't lose anything of all that my father has given me. I will raise it up on the last day. And then he says, I will raise him up. He's talking about a person, but he's also talking about a thing. And I love what Matthew Henry says. The body is a part of the man and therefore a part of Christ's purchase and charge. It pertains to the promises and therefore the body shall not be lost. The undertaking is not only that he shall lose none, no person, but that he shall lose nothing, no part of the person, and therefore not the body. Do we have bodies in the new heaven and new earth? Amen, we do, because God created us to be in a body. And though death temporarily separates us, and that's why death is so hard, it's hard to look at a casket. It's hard to look at a loved one whose spirit has gone from their body because it's a separation that was never meant to happen. Death is a separation that is absolutely against everything God desires. It is the last enemy. But our partaking of communion is part of the promise That Jesus came to save your soul and he came to save your flesh. Praise God. Christ's undertaking will never be accomplished till the resurrection when the souls and bodies of the saints shall be reunited and gathered to Christ that he may present them to the Father. Jesus, he saves our spirit and our body. They said, but isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down from heaven? And this is an interesting statement because the people who grew up around Jesus and knew his family were probably like, he's the kid I used to play kickball with. I know his mom and dad. Like, how could this Jesus be this bread of life? But I caution you. I caution you. 
If the Bible says the way that you know whether the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is in someone, is that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess uh, Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Communion has everything to do with the fact that we must believe that this Jesus who came in an ordinary uh, circumstance, who, who had a mother and father, who lived an ordinary life, it is crucial to understand that Jesus had a body of flesh and yet he is 100% God. Jesus, he is God in the flesh. And my friends, this is leading up to the reason he said, you must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. We're building up to that case. How important it is to hear what the Lord is saying. He went on to say, your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that you can eat of it and never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Do you see this heading up to the Last Supper and what Jesus said to his disciples? This miracle and this teaching happened on a mountainside before the Last Supper. But when the disciples sit down to the Last Supper, they no doubt remember Jesus saying, I'm the living bread. You have to eat of this bread. They probably couldn't fully wrap their minds around it at this point. But Jesus is working to make them understand. And I want you to notice from this that Jesus said something. Watch this. I am the bread that comes down from heaven so that you may eat of it and not die. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. How many Christians do you know that have ever died? We're like, but we do die. Even when we trust in Jesus, we go through the separation from our body. True. But what Jesus is trying to get us to understand, and this is so beautiful. He does such a mighty work in us that he reduces physical death to a mere parenthesis for us. Jesus feels so strongly and knows so strongly that the minute you close your eyes to this world, you wake up in his presence. He knows that so strongly that he pretty much says, if you trust in me, you'll never die. I mean, yeah, you'll be separated from your body for a temporary amount of time, but you will be alive, always alive. How important to understand. Tying this back with one scripture to the Passover, as we jump back to the Old Testament, you guys remember the Passover? How Jesus initially got his people out of the land of Egypt was the death of the firstborn. And when God sent the death angel down the streets of Egypt, and he said the firstborn in every household, man and beast, is going to die. How many of you remember what the only source of protection was from the death angel? Blood. Do you remember that? Blood. The blood shall be a sign for you. On the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Listen to me, my friends. This applied to the Israelites and the Egyptians. Because it applies to all of us. I deserve to be struck. I deserve to receive every plague and to be struck, struck by God with such a severe punishment for my rebellion against him that I could never even fathom it. We all do. There is only one source of protection. And I hope if, if you haven't been able to memorize big verses of the Bible, you can just remember this one phrase, Jesus this is God. This is Jesus. Here's what they're saying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. The people in that day had to take a lamb without any blemish. They had to slay the lamb, drain its blood into a bowl, take a branch, a hyssop branch, take blood from that bowl and paint it over the doorframe of their house. 
And when the death angel came and saw that blood of a perfect lamb, he passed over. How many of you know that you've got to take the blood of Jesus and you've got to paint it over your heart, so to speak. You've got to put your trust in the blood of Jesus. And when you do, not only does God protect you from death, as we've been speaking of, but he will not strike you with the terrible weight and guilt and punishment of your sins. He's got you. How beautiful is that? Jesus, his blood is our protection from death and all punishment for sin that comes as a result of who we are without Christ. Now let's move to the Last Supper with all these things in mind, the manna, the bread of life that Jesus connected to the manna, going back to the Passover and now moving forward to the Last Supper. We've talked about the flesh, we've talked about the blood, and now we move to the Last Supper, which is what Jesus honored with his disciples just hours before the Garden of Gethsemane. So let's move there. Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, now listen to what he said. Now they would have had that teaching in the on the hillside about the manna and Jesus being the bread of life. They would have had that as a backdrop in their mind when Jesus said these incredible words. He took bread. We have bread sitting here. Can you imagine? Jesus took a physical piece of bread. He broke it. He thanked God for it. He broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And as he was handing them that physical bread, he said, take and eat. This is my body. Now, we do not believe in transubstantiation, that the bread actually becomes the body of Christ. That does not make any sense at all because Jesus was physically sitting in front of them, handing them bread. All of his body was in place when he handed them the bread and he said, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And this is where communion, it just dives into something that is so mysterious and so deep that I don't believe that this side of heaven, we will ever understand how great and awesome it is what we do when we take the bread and the cup. But we need to think deeply about it. I want you to know something about every true Jewish person. Jesus was talking to his disciples who were Jews. They knew this commandment. Leviticus tells us the life of the flesh is in the blood. First of all, how do we know the life is in the blood? How many of you realize that if you cut a major artery in your body and you begin to bleed out, you're going to die if you lose all your blood? It's as simple as that. God made it that your life is in your blood. God said the life of the flesh is in the blood. I've given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. It is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, no person among you shall eat blood. Neither shall any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood. And I've been studying Psalm chapter 16 where David said, I will not pour out the blood offerings of the godless. Do you know that Satan has actually duped people throughout history and even today to believe that if they drink blood, animal blood, or even human blood, there's some kind of spiritual power to that? God forbade it. He said, you are not to eat, you are not to drink blood because the blood is so precious, it represents life. So when Jesus gave the cup to his disciples and said, drink, this is my blood, drink from it, all of you. That would have shocked them. But I want you to know something. The blood of all those millions and millions of animals that had been shed throughout the Old Testament 
could never pay for our sin. It temporarily placated God's wrath, but it could never take away our guilt. It was just an act of obedience. Martin Luther, before, in the time of the Reformation, he used to try to physically beat himself to the point of bleeding, thinking he could absolve his guilt. There's not a single ounce of blood, not a drop of blood anywhere that could take away your sin. Except for one person's blood. Hallelujah. And I think that's why Jesus said it this way. And he meant to shock his disciples when he said, I want you to drink this cup. I want you to drink my blood. The blood was forbidden because it is so precious. But you need to understand, if all blood is precious because all blood in every creature gives life, then how precious is the blood of God Almighty who put on flesh? And that's the only blood that you are ever to drink. And so as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he gave it. And he said, this is my body. He took the cup and he said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Does that remind you of what we talked about with the manna? Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Remember, they're Jews. They, they know, they're like, they keep seeing everything literally and are not understanding what Jesus is trying to communicate. And here's what he said. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Listen, I told you this is in the Bible. You want life? You think you have eternal life? Listen to what Jesus said. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, this is bigger than communion. So I'm pausing here to be very serious. If you think that you have eternal life because you have mentally said, I believe in Jesus, I believe he died on the cross, isn't Easter a wonderful holiday to celebrate? That does not mean that you have eternal life. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. John 3.16 3, is absolutely true. And so is this scripture. You must feed on the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ if you want to be saved and raised up on the last day. You say, Shelley, what, what does that mean? Here's the mystery of feeding on Christ. He used such a simple analogy. We all know what it's like to be hungry. We all know what it's like to eat. And we all know that we prefer foods that please our taste. I mean, if we're desperate and we're starving, we might eat a lot of things we wouldn't normally eat. But let's talk about feeding. Regular feeding. Because Jesus said it has to continue. By the way, and listen to me clearly, because I am called by God to preach his word. I want to tell you something. You don't put your trust in Jesus one day and then it's all over. You must continually feed on him. So what does this mean? Here's the mystery of feeding on Christ. Feeding implies an appetite. I have a question for you. Do you desire Jesus? Are you hungry for him? Or is he an obligation? Something you tend to because you're told you must. Feeding implies you have a real appetite. Feeding implies that you apply what you eat to your body. How many of you know when you eat, you don't want to vomit it back up. You want to eat it. It's got to go through your digestive system. And literally, quite literally, we are what we eat. Because once I was a tiny baby and now I'm a grown woman. And how did that happen? It came by the food that I ate. 
In some mysterious way, what we eat becomes who we are. And I have something to tell you right now. You've got to eat of Jesus on a regular basis if you want to say, I am his. He is in me. Hallelujah. If you want to be a child of God, you've got to feed on Jesus regularly. If you want to grow up spiritually, you can't take a meal of Jesus sometime in the past and say that was good enough for me because you're never going to grow. You are what you eat and you must eat of Jesus and never, never, never stop. Eating and feeding implies delight. Eventually we'll shut down. If what we try to eat never is brings enjoyment to us if it turns our stomach there is a delight in feeding on christ amen if i'm going to continually feed on him it pleases my soul sometimes it may be difficult but i will feel that satisfaction have you ever felt that satisfaction getting close to jesus it just fills you up and finally to feed on him continually means nourishment it means strength Perhaps you're watching this, and one of the reasons God has you watching it is you say, Shelly, I need to be stronger spiritually. I need to be stronger spiritually. I need to be more of who God has called me to be. Feed on Jesus. Feed on him. In a very mysterious way, we must eat of him and partake of him continually. This is what Jesus meant when we come to communion. This is what he meant when he said, as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread of the fathers that they ate, the manna. They ate it and they died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Now, obviously, feeding on Jesus is not a physical thing. Remember what he said? He said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Your fathers ate physical bread and died. We must feed on Jesus. We must take this word. This is the written word. Of the living word, Jesus Christ. We must take it into our hearts. Take it into our minds. Ingest it. We must sit with Jesus wherever we are. It's not a formality. There's not a certain prayer. You just need to get somewhere alone with Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I want to feed on you. Come in. Fill my heart. And fill my life and fill my soul. See, when we talk about the flesh of Jesus, the reason it's so important, the reason we must partake of his flesh is it represents his complete humanity. Do you realize that if Jesus didn't put on a very real body with muscles and skin, if Jesus didn't come to this earth and have true emotions that included pain and joy and yes, anxiety looking toward the foreboding future. If Jesus didn't put on a body and understand what it was like to be weak, to be tired, to die. If he didn't put on a body to have emotions, to know what we go through, to have a mind, to understand how the mind swirls about. If he did not have that, then his death and resurrection on our behalf could not really be applied to us. But he did die in a real body. So when we partake of communion and we eat of his flesh, how thankful are we that he put on real humanity? If he was only God, he couldn't stand in the place of humans. But he is God and man. So his flesh, the bread, representing his humanity to die in our place. And his blood, what did we learn from Leviticus? God said the life is in the blood. So his blood 
represents his life, which belongs to God. I am so grateful that I can partake of his flesh and his blood. That I know that because Jesus put on flesh, he understands me. He gets temptation. He gets struggles. He gets discouragement. He understands me. He is able to stand in my place and pray for me to the Father. He gets it. And I'm so thankful for his blood, which represents his life. He is God Almighty. Altogether sinless, altogether powerful, able to take the hit for sin in his flesh and yet yield his spirit to the Father and be raised up again. Hallelujah. And finally, we're going to take communion in just a moment, so have your elements ready. I want to remind you of something we've talked many times before. Every time you take communion, you should also be thinking of heaven because Jesus did. Jesus did. Here's what he said to his disciples. At the last supper, he said, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine till that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. I... I struggle to imagine hours before Gethsemane, his betrayal and arrest, his beating, his crucifixion, his death. I struggle to imagine that he is sitting peacefully with his disciples, honoring the Passover meal, eating the Last Supper, looking at his disciples and saying, this is my flesh. And he knows it's about to be broken. He knows exactly what he's saying. This is my blood, which is poured out for you. He knows what that means. They don't completely understand, but he does. I struggle to imagine the strength that it took for him to say those things, knowing he was hours from his agony. And even more so, such love for you and I that knowing he was walking into his greatest agony that he did not deserve, we deserved, but he was walking into it for us. Not only was he doing that, but he was looking past that and saying, we'll eat together again, but it won't be until that day when we drink it brand new in the kingdom of heaven. As we partake of our communion today, I want you to imagine all of the saints of God gathered together at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And this time as his disciples gather around him at that wedding supper of the Lamb someday soon, rather than him telling us of what was about to happen we will all look back together with him at the victory that was won and the glory that we are then in. Hallelujah. But for today, we are taking communion to look back and to anticipate what is yet to come. And to whom do we owe the reality of washed away sin and guilt and a brand new body to be raised up one day soon. To whom do we owe all of that? My friends, his name is Jesus. And it is his flesh and his blood in some mysterious and spiritual way Right now, we are about to partake of. I pray that the meaning of all these things throughout scripture has gone into your heart and you realize that if you expect to have life in Christ, you must always feed upon him. And taking communion is a beautiful reminder 
of the inner spiritual reality that should be taking place. Communion, although it may have been wrongly understood by many people throughout history, is not just a sacrament that you perform and somehow God is pleased with you. It is a representation of an inner reality. My craving and desire for Jesus, my applying what he has done to my heart and trusting fully in him. Hallelujah. With that in mind, I want you to get your communion elements, have them ready there. And we are going to take communion together. And I pray we're going to do so in a deep and rich way. And we are going to thank God Almighty for the bread that came down from heaven. That a man, woman, teenager, or understanding child can partake of, can eat of, and never die. Hallelujah. His blood, his flesh given for us. We'd ask you to pray with me. Dear Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word and to realize on a greater level each and every day what you have done for us, dear Jesus. We're about to take of communion during hours that represent your time laboring on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. And I can't wait, Jesus, to eat a meal with you in heaven. I'm so grateful to you for forgiving my sin. I'm so grateful that I can feed on you every day, that I can trust in you every moment. Lord, we want you. We thank you. And I pray that you bless these elements to our inner person. Help us to understand the greater reality. In Jesus' name. Now I ask you in this moment, I'm not going to pray it because you have to pray it in your own heart. I'm going to ask you in this moment. I want to tell you something. I've talked about this before and I want to remind you that it is very important to not take communion lightly and that when you do it to understand what you're doing. There's been a clear presentation of what you're doing here and what it means. So I ask each of us, and I will do the same, to just bow your heart and head before the Lord for just a moment and ask him to cleanse you completely of all your sin and to allow you to take this in a worthy manner. And listen, if you've never called on Jesus as your Savior, you can bow your heart to him right now and say, Jesus, save me. Forgive me and cleanse me. I want to take part in communion for the first time as a Christian. Take a minute and do that if you would. Amen. We thank you, Lord. If you have your bread or cracker and you take it with me, Remember, we are spiritually feeding on Christ. We are reminding ourselves, as Jesus said to do, that he is our source. Hallelujah. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus, we do remember you on this Good Friday. Let's eat together.
I just thank Jesus that as we partake of this communion, we can picture, as we ingest this bread, we can picture Jesus coming into our heart, into our soul, and building us up in him, and strengthening us in our relationship with him. Hallelujah. And I love to take the cup and think about Jesus saying that he won't drink of this cup again till the day he drinks it new with us in the Father's kingdom. What a day, what a glorious day that will be. So after supper, likewise, he took the cup also. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's given for you. Let's take of the cup together and remember that Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do it in remembrance of me. But he also said that we will do it again one day with him. And he said, we are continually proclaiming his death until he comes. Did you know that? Did you know that Paul records that for us? He says that Jesus said, as long as we continue to do communion together, we proclaim his death. It's not the end. His death was not the end. We proclaim his death until he comes again. We drink of his blood with all hope and thanksgiving. Let's drink together. Hallelujah. I thank Jesus so much. I thank him that we can feed upon him, have eternal life, and never die. My friends, I want to thank you for being a part of this communion service, but I also want to urge you. I want to urge you to take the rest of this day very seriously and soberly pondering Jesus' death. And then tomorrow, Saturday, is the in-between. He's in the tomb, but his promise is that he's coming out. And we think about it in our day. He died and rose again. He went to heaven. We're in the great long Saturday of life, but we know something. He's soon coming out of heaven and back here to get us. Praise God. God bless each one of you.